Looking forward to our time uh, together in the Word and uh, all that the Lord has for us. Um, we're going to pick up on some thoughts that we left off on last Sunday, Sunday as we celebrated Easter together and uh, look at perhaps some, again, very familiar verses, but ones that the Lord has been using this past week to press upon my heart a little bit about both who he is and what he desires in uh, my heart uh, and as a church body, our hearts and minds together and collectively uh, as we seek him. Let's pray. Pray and we'll start in today. Lord, thank you. Thank you again that today you are a God who is merciful and gracious. You again have given us so many blessings, and yet so often we can neglect to see the fullness of your work, all that you are accomplishing day by day, and that today you continue and faithfully uh, press on in that work that we might be found in your image, that you might guide us, direct us, shape us, mold us, and make us in the very likeness of your Son. That today as we come here together, it would be for a time that we might be encouraged in both who you are and what it is you are doing in our midst today, each and every day as we seek you. Thank you again that as we open your word this morning, again, it was with that only confidence that you are a God who desires to be known, who speaks to our hearts and lives, and uh, speaks to the spirit that dwells within us. Thank you for all that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we begin this morning, and we're going to be uh, looking at a few uh, passages, again, as I mentioned, familiar reminders, but in doing so, picking up as we looked last week, as we celebrated Easter together, we were looking at the fact that as we look back at Israel's history, that many of the things that they did, many of the places that they went, many of the things that happened to them, and many of the things that God did did with them were examples for us. Again, some familiar verses that I remind you of, uh, that when God dealt with them and was using them, it was in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11, it says, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And wasn't it amazing to look back and see that in all that time, if you look back at Israel's history and we looked at the Passover lamb and remember how detailed God was in not only what they were to do, but how they were to do it. They were to take this spotless lamb and not a bone on its body were broken and they were to take it in and verify that it was indeed spotless. They were to then take that lamb and paint that blood on the doorpost. And all of these things would lead towards this passing over of the angel of death. It is incredible the detail to which God worked with them. And as we looked last Sunday to see that incredible picture painted for us of a savior who had come spotless, verified that, that he was uh, in every way, without blame, a lamb to be sacrificed and now celebrated. And as I've been going through this week, it's been a, a pounding reminder that just as God was detailed in the work with their lives, and remember this, that history was telling his story. And that's what he was doing. He was using their history to tell his story. And in like manner, uh, God today desires you and I to be part of that story. That he to others might declare his goodness, his life, his way. And it reminds me uh, of a, a funny person, and I've told you before, uh, there's many people who've had a great impact on my life. One of those whom I knew before the Lord uh, took him to be with him uh, was Major Thomas, who started Cape and Ray. And, and we'd laugh at times because there were a few moments uh, where, and you can find a video called The Acorn. Why? Because he was a bit of a strange man. There were times in which he used to say, I'm carrying an oak tree in my pocket. 
And that might sound weird, but uh, what he would do is he would present testimony, and I always appreciated the fact that he would bring out an acorn out of his pocket and say, I have an oak tree in my hand. Why? And it was a beautiful picture of this fact that, that in that acorn, a seed was the potential to grow an incredible tree, a tree that would bear incredible fruit. And it was that acorn, that potential he once called a story untold or a story to be told. It was the potential that this seed had before it that when planted was going to grow, was going to bear fruit, and was going to be something. And that's been a great reminder this week as people ask me, how's the farm this week? And my response always is chaos as usual. Um, but over the time, I've had the privilege uh, of working with a master pruner this week. Uh, how do I know he's a master? He's from England. And when you share something with a British accent, it always sounds smarter. So uh, he's a master. He actually was born and raised in England, uh, was in forestry, learned, and, and I loved as he walked around our property, saw these aged old fruit trees that have been uh, well before, as I've told uh, some of you, our farm, there was a group of people called Dukabors that settled on Vancouver Island. Our farm was the hub of where they lived. And so uh, there's trees that they planted, uh, a hundred-year-old barn that's ready to fall down that they had a hand in building. Um, there, there are trees that we've planted. And, and to walk around with this gentleman and to have him look at these trees and, and, and to be able to speak of their history by seeing branches and growth, he was also able to look at trees we've planted and you'd see him just go like this. Shame, really, shame. And, 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 and then he'd hold out his pruners, and, and in a moment he'd say, uh, I'd like to do something, but I don't want to hurt you. That, that's what he said. He was more concerned about hurting me than my tree. Why would he say, no, listen, we're in it for the long haul here. We want you to do what's best for the tree. Not, not what scares me, not, not what, what we think is best. I want you to do what's best, not what's going to look good in a year. We want what's going to be best for 10 years. And then he'd haul out the pruners, and here he'd take this sapling that we planted two years ago, and we're thinking, it's not doing much of anything good. And he cut it in half, and he, like, lopped it off. And we're like, what have you done, Right? And I love the fact that he kept re referencing his early days growing up working at a greenhouse in England. And I can't remember the name, but he worked for this wonderful elderly lady. And he always kept saying this, and, and I'll say, Mrs. Hemsworth, for referencing, he'd say, Mrs. Hemsworth would never have let us leave the greenhouse with it looking like this. Right? And he told us how often that as they would walk, and I don't know if you've been to the greenhouse lately and bought a fruit tree, often it's a large stick coming out of a pot. And he said people would often be angry and shocked as he would place the pot in their car, haul out the pruners, and cut it in half. And they go, What have you done? And he would say, The best thing that can be done for this tree. Why? Because he understood that exactly where and when you needed to leave the bud that was going to produce the best branch that would promote the best growth. And as you watched him on a tree, again, as a, only a master can, you'd see him prune and cut and you'd say, why that one? And he'd say, so this one grows this way, and this is going to thicken this branch, and now it's going to bear fruit here and not there. And then he'd say, this is going to bring sunlight here, so this grows, whereas that was crowding that out. And then you'd see him come with his hand and clip something and rub something, and he'd say, what was that? <laughs> he'd say, well, I just rubbed out this bud. Why that bud? Well, I rubbed out the bud on the south side so that the bud on the north side would grow and be directed to the sun and grow up instead of out. Like just 
incredible small things that he didn't even have to think about, but he could tell us as he did his work and tried to tell me, uh, as thick-headed as I am, how to do it so that next year I could do likewise and make a total mess of everything he did, right? The thing is this, that with incredible purpose, incredible vision, what did he do? He pruned, he cut, he picked, and he molded and shaped that tree so that in the long term, it would not look good today. And there were many who would come and say, what have you done? Because things look bare and in some cases barren. And yet in the long term, he knew. He knew what he was doing. He knew why he did it. And he knew where he was taking it. And as I began to get an understanding, interestingly enough, it's as we read, last week we looked at this incredible ceremony, the Passover. And there were verses that were left for us that we read in part that said this. And I want to note this this morning, verse 24 in Exodus in chapter 12. It says, you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And when you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised you, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? You shall say it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord. You passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. You see, there is this place and this purpose here that they would not only celebrate this feast, but that they would do so remembering and passing on why they do it. And this has been a big part uh, of our jumping into farming and, and being a part of a farming culture. It's been incredible meeting people who have farmed our area for 50 years and for some third, fourth generation farmers. And we'll say, when do we plant our seed? And you know what? They'll look up at Mount Aerosmith, which we see from our farm, and they'll go, the snow hasn't left that part of the peak. Not yet. And you're like, I thought it was more scientific than that, <laughs> right? And they'll say, I didn't see dew fall at, at this height and not that height. No, not now. And it, what, what has happened is it's become intuitive. From generation to generation, they've seen things, experienced things. And in many cases, you wouldn't know it unless you asked. And there's a failure in some circles to pass down. And we're finding ourselves hungry for a knowledge that, that's slowly being forgotten and, and fascinating, right? But here was this incredible push and purpose to remember. And if there's anything, if you can remember last Sunday, we mentioned a few things, and that was this. One was that as we focus on Easter, not only were we remembering his death, but we were proclaiming his life. And his resurrection life was proclaimed, not just in a ceremony, but in the substance of living likewise as he lived. Remember that I might not be selfish, but selfless. That I might not be a taker, but a giver. That I might not take up my life, but let go of my life and hand it to the Father. That just as he became dependent on his Holy Father, so I might to live in dependency that I proclaim in giving up my life as he gave up his before a watching world, forgiving the unforgivable, right? Strengthening the weak, loving the unlovable, that we would proclaim that life and in doing so be a living testimony to his resurrection, that he broke the chains of death. Now here's the key. <laughs> this week, I find that my Easter celebrations often stay on Easter. 
And today, as I've been going through a week of pruning, cutting, and clipping things, here's what I've been reminded of. That this celebrating his life by living, it's a daily process. And one that isn't celebrated in a one-time event or one-time effort, but an ongoing molding, shaping, and making. Again, familiar verses. Listen again to John 15, which we've read often. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Listen to what he says in John fifteen fifteen. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, and that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, may, uh, he may give to you. Did you notice, not only has he given you fruit, but he has chosen you that you might have fruit that might remain. That we are to not just bear fruit once, but to continuously bear fruit. And in doing so, that fruit is to be a proclamation of God's living life. But here's how that fruit continues. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. Notice this. Daily we are carrying about the dying of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. That ongoing dying. That continuous death. That's the pruning that the Lord desires. And it is easy on an Easter Sunday. To take a moment and count the cost and consider that picking up your cross and following him. A, a dying to self that we may know him unto life. And yet, to leave it on that Sunday? No, dying was a process. Pruning was an ongoing event. That things might continually be cut, trimmed, clipped, and cropped. For the better, fuller, and greater fruit that the Lord desires. You see, today, I know there are times when I become comfortable in my Christian walk. And, and I might not say it outwardly, but seasons will go, be, go by where I may have deceived myself into thinking, I'm doing okay. I've got this. I've made it. I'm here. And as we were pruning those trees, every time we'd step back, and here's the interesting thing, every time we'd finish a tree together, we'd take our ladders down, come over to another tree, and as we were pruning the other tree, couldn't help to look back at the tree we had just finished. And guess what happened every time? I missed a branch. I totally missed one. And you know what? While we were in the tree, I couldn't see it. But now that I'm over here on a ladder from that vantage point, that limb's got to go. And, and we take down the ladders and before forgetting, go back over, climb right back up and take it off. Because you know what? Sometimes it, God deals with us, lessons are learned, and we think, I made it. 
But it's not until we take a few steps further and look back and from that new vantage point, the Lord says, oh no, there's more to remove. And and I feel at times it's like that shock of watching him snip off my sapling that's been growing for two years for no value whatsoever and watch him hack it off and say, time to start over. And today, I realize as we continue forward, we can't get comfortable. We can't become comfortable or grow content being where we are today. We were never meant to proclaim Jesus by our perfection. I wish we were able. But again, if I am honest with you today, I am the furthest thing from perfect there ever is. No, we were to proclaim Jesus not by our perfection, but by our transformation. From what we were to what we are becoming. For what we've been to where we're going. To the fruit we had, to the fruit we will grow. And as we begin to look at the Lord's work, we need to guard our hearts as I am learning to guard my own. Why? That we don't become content with the fruit that we see. The fruit was never intended for us. And here's the hard work. As we were looking at those branches, it was fascinating to see One, where he would look and see things lopped off and he'd say, that was a mistake. (laughs) Someone cut that and shouldn't have. And then we'd see other branches and he'd say, that was a mistake. (laughs) That should have come off years ago. You see, there were many things that were telling about not only what that tree was, but how that tree got there. And today, as we look back, and I want to look again at that, those verses in Exodus 12. What did it say? When you do these things and your children ask why. We are to be faithful to remember not just the good things, not just the celebrations, not just the victories, but also the prunings, the cuttings, the hardships. And in a time of uh, social media, and this is interesting, um, uh, there's uh, (laughs) a time in which now on Facebook, if you read articles, they're talking about a society in which people are only putting out the good things. People want to be seen victorious. And so you only put up the best images, right? The images of your kids, of your vacations, of you doing things that make it seem like you've got it all together. There's nothing better than putting those things up for your classmates that you knew 20 years ago and having them go, wow, they're doing well. In fact, you can pay a company today and now knowing that now when you go and apply for a job, they will look at your Facebook and they will search for you on social media. You can pay a company today to create for you a fake profile. And while you are putting pictures of yourself partying on Saturday night on your Facebook, they've created one in your name where they're putting up pictures of you with the post, Uh, helped out at the orphanage this weekend so that when you give it to an employer, they will look up and go, wow, great person. But isn't that it? We love to promote and put forward all the good things, the good fruit, the good signs, the good branches, right? I have one friend this weekend who posted on Facebook and we had to laugh because he put a picture of a sewer snake. Uh, If you don't know what that is, it's not something you want to use. Uh, It means you're having problems. Uh, He put a picture and has had a rough day today. (laughs) Sometimes my friends put more information than you want to know and put things you don't want to see on there, right? But listen, when we remember, here's what's important. We don't remember just the good. 
Just the, just the things that went well. Here's what's important to remember. The branches that were cut off. You see, it's when you get to the book of Joel, and we're reminded of this in Joel 1. Uh, it, it says, uh, hold on, I've got it marked here somewhere, and now I've lost it. Um, in Joel chapter 1, it actually tells us that they were to remember, and it wasn't the good things. And now I'm not, I always have a hard time finding they hide in the middle of those minor prophets. Um, it says this, the word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, O elders, and listen, inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days or in your father's days? Tell your sons about it. Let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. And what the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What were they to remember? Oh, not just the blessings of the Lord, but what? Oh, when the Lord was coming with the saw and the loppers to hack things off. You've erred. You've gone off track. Listen to this. Judges. And, and here's a problem. Verse 33 of chapter 8 in the book of Judges. It came about as soon as Gideon was dead that the sons of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Pereth their God. Thus the sons of Israel did not remember that the Lord their God would deliver them from the hands of their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the household of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, in accord to all the good that he had done to Israel. What had they done? They had failed not only to remember God's good things, but what had they, what had they done? They, they failed to remember and pass down to their offspring what happened when they failed the Lord their God and put an idol in his place. They failed to pass on the loppings and the cuttings and the hardships and the hurts that came with the pruning of God. You see, today, it's important to remember. And that remembering is going to be a testimony a testimony, as Paul writes, as we've just read, listen, we're afflicted, we're, we're, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13, having the same spirit according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is dec decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Notice this. <laughs> He's caring about the dying of Jesus. Why? All these things are for your sake, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Do you remember 2 Corinthians chapter 1 in which Paul says, We were brought to the end of ourselves. Why? So that we might not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. You see, Paul was sharing not... In his victories, but what? Sometimes in his greatest defeats. It was Paul in the book of Romans that said, huh, Chief sinner am I, right? Wretched man that I am. The very thing I want to do, I cannot seem to do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I seem to do it all the time. What was he sharing? Paul, listen. I have a thorn in my flesh, and I've prayed three times that God would take it away. 
And yet has he? No, but God has said this, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And he left it so that he would not become proud. You see, Paul shared not in great victory, but what? Sometimes in his greatest defeats, sometimes not in the very things that you might think one should put forward, but things that should fall behind. In his failures, in his hurts, in his hardships. Him saying, a chief sinner that he was, what? An accuser of the church. And heartily going along with those who murdered the church. You see, Paul shared many of the things that didn't seem fruitful at all. In fact, they were the things that God needed to lop off, chop off, trim, crop and cut. That is the genuine place where these very things were for their sakes so that the grace which is spreading to more and more may cause a giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. See, today, you are a growing testimony of the Lord. And he is as interested in your life as he was the Israelites. The detail in which he knows every hair on your head the detail in which he went to look and know that they would take in a lamb, count it spotless and verify just as he was to then present his only begotten son and take him from Pilate to Herod to Pilate to leader to verify that he was in fact spotless. That no bone on the lamb's body was broken, that no bone on his body would be broken. In, in effect, fulfilling all of the prophecies. Is God that detailed in our lives today? That he might share his story through your history? Going back to Major Thomas, that your life is a seed, a story waiting to be told. And yet if you only show the good, if you only remember the best, it's only half the story, isn't it? For we all have the scars of pruning, of hardship, of hurt, of mistakes, of sins. And that testimony is one in which bears fruit, not about what we were, but about where we're going and about how God is getting us there. I'm being reminded because it is so easy when we meet people crossing paths, how are you today? Good, right? Facebook, pick the good pictures. Put the best performance out there. Hard to say, rough. Hard to be genuine and say, I did it again. The Lord's been pruning. <laughs> Hard to say, boy, uh, uh, there's a stronghold in my life. I need the Lord and I need him to do some cutting. That's as great a testimony as the victories. When I can be comfortable to, to share my weakness and remember his story through history, as we've talked about the people he chose to use, Jacob, a runner and a liar, who God chose to be one who God would make into one who strives with God and man and overcome. Jacob became Israel. Abraham, an old man, an exalted father, <laughs> old with a barren wife. And God chose to transform and make into that person in which he became an exalted father of a multitude. But he had to declare his barrenness before he could become fruitful. Jacob had to address his falsehood and his lies before he could become God's chosen. Today, 
we may need to deal with a few branches. And as we dealt with one old tree that must be many years old, at one point he said, if I don't take this off, it's going to pull the whole tree down as it was on a lean. And there were things that were holding it back, holding it down. Today, am I the type of person who remembers and is ready to put forward the testimony that would bring about an incredible grace that others might be encouraged that in my weakness there is a strong God who supports, that in my failure there is a God who can lead to victory. But if you never see my cracks, you'll never see what mended me. If we did not know of Israel's slavery, we would never know how great their freedom was. Today, we are all God's work. We are God's church. And I am praying this week that God guards my heart from those moments in which I say the words, I've arrived. Or perhaps, good enough, God. You've trimmed enough. There's a point of maturity in my heart and I won't say that I have fully embraced it yet, but when I can look to God and say, as I said to the master pruner, do whatever you need to do. Because sometimes there's a bit of shock there when he starts hacking things. And I don't like it and I don't want it on the earthly perspective. But in the heavenlies, I want it. And today I have to ask, Lord, not good enough, not just okay, but have your way. And isn't that celebrating Jesus' life, in which again, we looked at last week, where Jesus said, Father, thy will be done. Are we ready to go there? The Lord is prompting my heart and, and encouraging the so many places in which he needs to do work. And today, as I always try to leave you in a place where we can look and focus and hear from the Lord, I can only encourage you in that like manner. What's the Lord reminding you today to remember? Because you know what? I'm reminded of things that as I live with my children, I want to remind them. Not just of the good things. Like when I turn to my kids and say, oh, your old man was pretty good at basketball in the day I could hold my own, right? You want to put that out there. But to also say, hey, kids, I failed miserably. And I want you to know the Lord's taken off a few branches. And sometimes there will be a learning and a lesson for those children. And other times it is heartache to watch when they need to learn those lessons for themselves and choose to just as I chose but we need to be faithful. Faithful to remember God's victories. Faithful to remember the Lord's victories over things that he's needed to do work. And to be honest, where God is continuing to do that work. And to be able to share with my kids, I failed again. I'm a sinner and I need the Lord. And today they see my dependence more than they see the pretense of, of what I would like them to see, which is my victory. Because when I can show them and be honest about how I fail as a father, it can only turn them to the one who is the perfect father. And that is the Lord. And more than anything, what I want is them to know him as their great and wonderful father, their counselor, their king. And so today, a story waiting to be told. What's the story that God is working on in your life? What is he shaping? What is he molding? Let's not hold back as those who might from sharing it, that it might lead to a greater glory in which today God wants to share his faithfulness in your life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that today again you might be king of our lives. And that we might be reluctant to allow you to go to work. 
to trim, to cut, and to prune. We know that while perfection is not possible on this earth, progress is. And you desire to shape us, to mold us, to change us. Day by day, a process of daily dying. Thank you that we have shared that death on the cross, that we might now turn our back on those things that were of old and now embrace the life that is anew, one that we find in you alone. May we be those branches who abide in the vine, the source of true life, but also know that along with that life comes the constant dying daily to the things that we are, to the things that we've been, to things that we've become, but do not want to be. Thank you that as children, you discipline, you love, you reprove, you pull onward. You are faithful to complete this good work that you have begun. And today I pray that again, uh, that I would put myself in your hands as a faithful father, a king, who we know with all detail and love and care knows best. Thank you for what you are doing in each and every one of our lives in this church, through this congregation, on this island and beyond, as you continue to share your life through the genuine testimony of the weak becoming strong, foolish wise, the poor rich, and those without a king into a holy kingdom of God. Thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.